operations. Uh, uh, Professor James, please start uh, when you are ready. I will, I just had to um, stop sharing so that I could unmute myself. Oh, okay. This darn system. Okay, apologies. So, um, it says I'm talking about the fast radio burst population status and updates, and I'll be focusing on repeating fast radio bursts. So before I begin, I'd like to pay my respects to the Wajib people of the Noongar Nation, that are the traditional owners of the land, Rang Karapayon, and also the Wajiri Yamaji people, as the traditional owners of uh, the site where ASCAP is based, which is now being renamed, an Inram, oh, I'm afraid I cannot pronounce this, Inramanya Inkara, <coughs> which means sharing the stars in the sky. Also, thanks to the organisers for the remote presentation. Um, Various peoples are getting effect, badly affected by climate change, and astronomers do have an impact. And also, remote presentations can be more inclusive. For instance, people with kids. Okay, let's begin with a brief intro to craft. So, the modelling of the FRB population work is being done by these lovely, handsome and witty people up here. Uh, but, of course, all of this depends on a vast team of people who have more or less worked on different aspects of the instrument. So, one key aspect of this is our high time frequency data. So, as you may or may not have noticed, recently our pipeline paper has gone up on archive, Celebi, named after this cute little Pokemon here, it's meant to be the voice of the forest or something like that. Um, so now we've got the computing out of the way, we're going to be publishing uh, physics results from this. Also, something you might hear more later from Shivani's talk, is about our beautiful host galaxy localizations. So this plot of seven by three localized FRBs, most of them with red chips, was produced by Lachlan. And you see you know, some beautiful spiral galaxies. And one of the key things we're looking at is getting really precise localizations. So not just identifying the galaxies, but where the FRBs are coming from in the galaxy. Although when you get an FRB with a red chip just over one, then um, your ability to resolve the galaxy might not be very good because galaxies look like a blob even to the VOT. But we got one localised at a redshift over, over one, so great. Um, and of course, if we're talking about FRB localizations, um, I hope Vikram's watching because now we're getting um, competition from DSA 110. So, how are we going to try to take back the mantle of the best of the world leading instrument for FRB localizations? Well, in the future, we're going to do a craft, uh, uh, craft coherent upgrade, or CRACO. So we should increase our sensitivity by a factor of five or so, get one FRB every one or two days, and this is currently being commissioned. So, okay, the uh, beginning of the science, the redshift DM relation. So, this is known as the Macar relation. We've already seen this plot. Redshift on the x-axis, uh, cosmological, estimated cosmological DM on the y-axis, and the mean baryonic density of the universe is this black line and an initial sample of five ASCAP localised FRBs with a few other localised fast radio bursts is consistent with expectations from the mean baryonic density of the universe. So wonderful, right? DM is a proxy for redshift. However, if you just take that plot and you turn it on its side, which is very easy to do in PowerPoint, you will see that for a given dispersion measure, you do not get a one to one prediction for redshift, right? This cluster of FRBs with DM cosmic of about 300 goes from a redshift of about 0.1 to 0.4. So for all of you using DM as a proxy of redshift, please stop. Um, and in case that didn't convince you, we of course have this lovely detection from about a year and a half ago from fast with this FRB with a huge excess DM. And of course, um, Shivani will probably talk about 21 and 117, which has also got a large excess DM. So there's a lot of papers out there that assume a one-to-one -one redshift dispersion measure relation. Don't believe them. Please try when you're doing modelling of the FRB population. Use localised FRBs or include the large spread um, of dispersion measure about the mean. It's really true. Right? The universe is not uniform. So um, this is all my cautionary tales here. Um, if if you want to know how to do this, read Liam Connor's paper, which spells out the process you need to go through. And if doing that is all too hard, you know, it's this lovely tool, FRB Poppy. Gardenia and I have written it and published a few papers on this. I'm told it's fairly easy to use. 
I don't use it because I use this much more difficult uh, thing here. This is a Monte Carlo method, which means it's very easy to simulate various complex effects and correlations, but it also means it's not very well suited for optimization of parameters, um, which is why when you see the FRB poppy papers, they usually use about four different scenarios, whereas in our papers here, we usually use about 10 million or so. Um, so in the early era, 2020 and beforehand, simple models were okay, but now there's no excuses. So basically, I trust these people. Ray Lowell's done did what I consider the first um, correct implementation of Liam Connor's method, and Caitlin Shin's got a paper on the art archive modeling giant, and they she's done an excellent job uh, doing this modeling. About the rest of the papers in the literature, well, maybe we should take thumpers advice for those of you who know Bambi. Okay, so what have we actually been doing? So we this is the group here working on modeling the population of FRPs. Well, you start out with a bunch of data, which is non-trivial because you need to make sure there's no biases inherent in your data. Use a dispersion measure, signal to noise ratio, redshift if available. You include your various biasing effects, right? Telescope beam shape, FRB width distribution, um, and your DM dependent bias. You model a whole bunch of parameters, right? Host galaxy properties, fast radio burst luminosity functions, spectral dependence, source evolution. Um, I assume that was just somebody coughing and not trying to interrupt me to tell me something. Um, and the cosmology, right? The Hubble constant and feedback. And, well, you throw this into a big, in this case, eight-dimensional cube of parameters. Um, you derive your probability of observations and you get some best fits. So at the moment, our best fit looks like this, where the dots are localized graph fast radio bursts. The lines are things with a dispersion measure, but for various reasons we don't have a host galaxy. And you have to be very careful that this lack of host does not bias you. For instance, these ones we don't have a host because of technical issues. These ones, to some extent, we don't have a host because it's distant, so we need to care about that. Um, and we've got nice results on the population evolution, on the Hubble constant, on the host galaxy dispersion measures, and frequency dependence. Okay. And then, of course, we detect this lovely thing um, out here, which is allowed, but it's one of the more extreme events. Okay, the latest update here is to do with feedback. So, feedback, as far as simulations, is a process which, for most astrophysicists, is an extremely complicated galactic level process by which gas stops, um, gets pushed out. You don't just have cooling flows into galaxies. You get energy injected into the intergalactic medium. Now, for simulation purposes, it, may, it makes the universe more uniform. It stops all the baryons getting very clumpy. And it means that you have less spread in the DM. If there's low feedback, then all the baryons are able to fall into small, dense halos, at which point most of your universe is empty and most of your FRBs have a low DM, but the ones that intersect halos have a large excess DM. However, if there's high feedback, if it's difficult for gas to get in there, it all exists in very diffuse halos, and you're much more likely to get your um, FRB cosmic dispersion measure lying along the Macau relation. So how does this interact with estimates of the Hubble constant? So the main constraint you get on H0 is from the minimum density of cosmic voids. Right? What we mean by that is that it's very easy to get get excess dispersion measures, but there's this area here where you just get no FRBs because there's always some minimum gas at a certain redshift. And so the slope of this part is very strongly connected with the Hubble constant, right? The dispersion measure linearly proportional to the Hubble constant. I'll ask me a question about that later if you like. Um, so imagine you have a Hubble constant here. Well, that's fine. You can easily account for these observations with excess DM. But this is completely ruled out because there's no way you're getting some negative dispersion measure from anti-electrons, right? That's not the way this works. So, okay. But, and so this is why you get a stronger constraint on lower values of the Hubble constant than and a weaker constraint on higher values, right? That's why you get asymmetric constraints. However, let's look at the feedback plots up here you see that the slope of this minimum dispersion measure 
is actually governed not by just the slope of the Macar relation, but by the amount of feedback you have. And that means when you go to do a fit to data, you vary your Hubble constant and you vary your feedback from no feedback whatsoever to a huge amount of feedback, you get quite a degeneracy here. Right? So it's a fundamental degeneracy. So at the moment with FRBs, we can't really measure the Hubble constant without knowing feedback. However, because we have measurements of the Hubble constant independently, you can then constrain the amount of feedback in the universe to these values. So, that's why I'm going to stop talking about FRB cosmology here. There's a lot more I could discuss, and there's a lot of systematics. But I'd like to get together a group of people who are interested in doing the hard stuff and getting a dedicated workshop. So please contact me if you're interested in doing this seriously. It's very easy to draw a straight line to a fit to points and call it the Hubble constant. It's much more difficult to convince the cosmological community you're doing it with sufficient rigor that you can actually overturn either um, the Planck measurements or the supernova 1A measurements. Okay, part three, repeating fast radio bursts. So, um, something we hopefully can all agree on. At least some fast radio bursts do repeat. Maybe all of them, maybe not, but at least some do. And some FRBs do repeat more often than others. Right? We see relatively nearby repeaters, relatively distant or powerful ones. We know that repeating FRBs at most produce all bursts. They might not produce all of them, they might produce that, but they're definitely not producing more than all the bursts. So we have an upper limit. Um, so it means there's a population of repeating FRBs. So it means you can ask, what are its properties? So, because everything is a power law, or at least everything is a power law until proved otherwise, let's model the repeating fast radio burst population with this. Right? There's a distribution of repetition rates with some, um, you know, some total number of repeaters, and then the rate at which the number density of repeaters repeating at a certain rate are scales with gamma, right? Gamma r, and you can do that between some maximum rate r max from the strongest repeaters perhaps down to a minimum rate, which is either zero or some FRB death line, analogous with pulsars. And so when I say rate R, and from now on, it's the rate above 10 to the 30 erg per hertz, right? So ten, or roughly 10 to the 39 ergs. So this has now been implemented in a development branch that no one's looked at yet except me of the ZDM code, but it will be publicly available any year now. Okay, so. What science can we get from this? So from this differential index gamma r, observationally, if gamma r is greater than minus two, then FRB observations should be dominated by strong repeaters, right? And less than minus two is dominated by weak repeaters. Theoretically, gamma r is a combination of whatever spin down or energy loss mechanism is powering the FRBs, right? And the initial birth rate distribution, right? Whatever initial batteries power, power, uh, um, powering FRBs will have different distributions at birth. From R min R max, um, we have our best constraint on R min, assuming all FRBs are repeaters, which they may well not be, um, comes from FRB 2017 10 20, where follow-up observations constrain it to have a rate above 10 to the 30 erg hertz of less than 0.01 per day. Right? It's pretty close, we've spent hundreds of hours looking at it. On the other hand, something like 2012-1102 is a strong repeater, and the rate is a few a day above 10 to the 30 per hertz, right, which is first sort of noted by law et al. So you have one, if you want to model all FRBs as being repeaters, again they may not be, you have to have R min less than this rate, R max greater than this rate, and then get, and R tells you about the distribution between them. So there were some previous results we published on this that was based on the ASCAP FRB follow-up program. So you've got to be careful. We had to discard all the times up until the first burst because that's bias information, right? That's what you use to identify your burst. Any case, we um, jumped through some hoops, derived some limits, and this was one limiting plot, right? And gamma R, um, R min here on this 2D plot. And you can rule out this because most bursts did not come from strong repeaters because we only found one to repeat in 19, not two. Um, I also thought that when Bin Lu had done some work 
on this, but I couldn't find any reference to that. So okay, there's some existing constraints. Now, what do we actually um, expect though, right, when we're looking at distributions of repeating FRBs in the universe? Well, obviously, not all repeaters will be seen to repeat, right? Um, nothing is a repeater when it's first observed, it's only a repeater when it's second observed. So Gardenia et al, using FRB poppy, did a quick simulation of this, and the plot on the right might seem very obvious when explained, but it's not necessary. I appreciate it. You have a distribution of repeating FRBs. You have a maximum DM given its distance, right? So this is um, with respect to distance. And you see that most of them are observed in the nearby universe as repeaters, whereas the true repeaters that are seen as once-off bursts are seen in the more distant universe. And of course, the intrinsic population is much more biased towards the distant universe because there's more volume there. Right, so it's just emphasising you expect to see your repeaters in the nearer universe and therefore should be at lower DM. But of course we know that DM and distance aren't one-to-one -one proxies for each other. The other thing to note is that Chine, as far as I'm aware, and I think it's the case, is the only telescope to detect repeating FRVs. Now the caveat that is that at, in an unbiased way, and it's not actually a little biased, but remember that all other repeaters have been detected in dedicated follow-up observations that were specifically targeted to look for bursts that were already identified. CHIME is the only telescope to have detected a repeating FRB in an unbiased way. So if you're trying to model this, just pretend that no other FRBs have ever been detected to repeat except those by CHIME. Best thing you can do for yourself. Okay, so when implemented in the ZDM code, what does this look like? So I asked, what if all FRBs were like 12, 11, 02, and they are not? Please only look at the red lines to begin with. This is a complicated plot, so please focus on the red. X-axis, redshift. Y-axis, number of uh, bursts a day. The black line is the total number of bursts. No matter how long you observe for, your expected number of bursts per day, day is the same. What we have here in the solved line is a number of um, single bursts you detect. Right? So here's the total number of bursts, here's the number of single, single bursts, and you see it towards higher redshifts. In the dotted line down here, this, this is the total number of FRB progenitors, right? and it's FRB repeaters, so one point per repeater. The dot dashed line is the number of bursts from repeaters. So if you want to model the total burst population, you should be summing all, all bursts from repeaters plus single bursts, because dot dashed plus solid gives you the total. If you only, instead, use a single burst from a repeater and add that to the single ones, you get this dashed line, which is the total progenitors you observe. Of course, if you allow yourself to use all the bursts from progenitors, you're subject to fluctuations. So you can't really win. So that's the first message. Okay, there's a lot of complexities here, which I absolutely will skim over, but it's important to note that they exist, right? Period, periodicity, burstiness is a thing. Different host DMs, maybe, from repeating FRBs, complicated time frequency structure. And to emphasize an effect of some of these complexities, and I really will skim through this, if you take the model from Chime of the intrinsic FRB population, we have a very good model of burst structure, which is based on observations. But for instance, the ZDM, these two functions, F and DM, are in truth correlated, right? They're not independent. Um, so my code, ZDM, does not take this into account. The Chime observations, at least um, in the catalog, I think this was something that um, Xin et al did, didn't initially take these into account. And so, um, when you do your calculations, when you use a bias function for a telescope, right? so you have, this is your bias function you calculate. Your bias function is a combination of your pulse injection system and your assumed intrinsic properties. So turns out that this gets kind of messy as to exactly how you model telescope biases. Okay, now I've thoroughly confused you all, let's get to the question, right? Let's actually do this with time. And can we, or can I, reproduce the Chime single burst DMs? So first of all, if I throw the Chime 
function and, and shin at our best fit into my code, right? You get the blue line, and here's observations of single bursts by Chime. And you see that fits okay, but not quite well. So the difference between blue histogram and blue dash line is more or less systematic differences in code. Um, however, clearly some of these various models are able to explain the time. Five minutes, is it? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. So we can reproduce the um, Chime distribution, but it's difficult and it's complicated. Okay, so now let's do some fits to the Chime repeaters, right? Here in orange is the repeating distribution, but the repeat Chime repeaters here. Let's fit that population as a function R min, R max, and gamma. So if we integrate over gamma, we see on the x-axis our space of R max, y-axis the space of R min, and this is the ridiculous region where R min is more than R max and therefore nonsensical. Um, you see that depending on your population model, right? Left plot is population model one, right plot is population model two, you get quite different areas of best fit, right? This is fitting for the number of repeating FRBs you expect. But what you see in either case the best fit region, here or here, lies outside the allowed range where your R max has to be at least as great as 12, 11, 02, and your R min has to be at least as low as 17, 10, 20. So there's plausible fits, but not the best fits. So if your entire FRB population does not repeat, you get rid of this constraint completely, right? which obviously would allow you to get to this and best fit region here. Okay, so what about this population index gamma? Okay, this will be mostly a meaningless plot for most people. Here we have gamma on the x-axis and the Bayesian posteriors on the right axis. And each coloured plot is a different population model, right? And so you see that which population model is correct is important, right? It varies a lot. This is all very much a work in progress, I should say. Um, but what you can point to is say, well, okay, if you compare different predictions for different dipole spin down, you can get, uh, you, you predict this range of gamma. If you've got ambipolar diffusion of magnetars, you might expect this value of gamma R, and various orbital interactions can give you this range. So we can start to constrain some of these, and I think the real trick will be to pin down the current uncertainties in the FRB population model. Um, now, if you want to try to model the DM distribution of chime repeaters, this is what we get. This is only the repeaters from catalog one. I'm yet to include the recent updated sample of um, chime repeaters, so I'm looking forward to doing that. But you see, the various population models can and do predict it uh, fairly well, the distribution of chime repeaters, but there's some high DM repeaters missing. Um, though I understand, as I found out, this morning, there are some high DM repeaters in the new release. So, future predictions, right? People predicted, as time goes on, will the repeater population saturate? Will we detect all the repeaters out there? Well, if these models are correct, no. What we have on the x-axis is time with units of the Chime FRB catalog one being one, right? That's about a year's worth of data. 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years. And according to these models, the various different ones, the rate of the repeaters will increase for the next 100 to 1,000 years, but in 10,000 years, most models are predicting we will start to saturate. So that's a future prediction, let's put it on the internet and people, my distant descendants, can tell me if that's correct or not. Okay, so conclusions so far, right? This is not, this is still a work in progress. Um, the statistical properties of repeating FRB population are important, right? You could use it to rule out one versus two populations. Right? Could you, you could use it to rule out there being only one population. You could uh, look at the mechanism powering FRBs, um, and it's important to account for in the bias of population studies. Now, please use Chime data, right? Everything else has to be treated very carefully. Um, and also, please do it properly. I don't really like being a nasty referee, but I will be a nasty referee if you make me. Um, this has been implemented publicly but available 
code, and I show you some preliminary results, but they're preliminary, let's see how it evolves, and they're very simplistic, right? Only for song distributions of arrival times. And I do think that it would be nice to start building a bit of a community of people who want to do serious FRB cosmology. Um, maybe FRB fraternity for finding feedback, or F5 is my one-up and chip on F4. So please hit me up if you're interested, and thank you very much. Oh, really, please. Hi, uh, yes, uh, really, yes, thanks for uh, interesting talk here, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure I followed all the details, and so I have to do too much mental cal calculations on the fly here. But I was just trying to understand, maybe you I'm have sorry, a simple picture. Um, actually not getting my audio, I just got to switch my audio system. And... Okay, let me know if you can actually hear me now. Yeah, there's no address. Hi, Krasi, do you hear us? Yes, certainly can. Maybe. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, intriguing talk. I certainly uh, enjoyed listening to it, and I was trying to reconstruct some of the um, basic scalings in there. And I got a bit confused, so if you can maybe explain. Let's take a simple universe. Where, which is truly Euclidean, and there's no, and which, which is still at low redshift, the redshift up to maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3, Euclidean intuition at least you might think holds. And then some of the things you said, um, I'm just trying to reconcile this, so if, the, if you have a single power law of repeaters, with this gamma, there's this critical threshold at minus two, of, um, where you, it diverges near or far. In the Euclidean space, I would have thought if it diverges near, all of the total number of FRBs detected by time also diverges. So I would have naively said you always have to put in a broken power law just to get a finite number of FRBs, but you don't need to have to, so maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, so I think the answer is that there's two power laws. One is the power law of the total burst population, so the total number of bursts. And the other one is a power law as to how those bursts are distributed between strong repeaters and weak repeaters. So, the power law that you're referring to about bounding or unbounded number of bursts, that's the power law that's described in the total FRB population. Um, which is also about minus two, actually, um, coincidentally. But in the case of repeaters, it's simply saying however many bursts we have, and whatever the distribution of energies from those bursts is, how do we divide you know, this hundred bursts, or these ten bursts, or these thousand bursts between um, strong and uh, weak repeaters. No, I understood that. That, that, part, that part I understood. So I think maybe just make it simpler. If all FRBs are, come from the exact same population, and they're all repeaters, forget about complicated, I just want to make the simplest, simplest thing, and I've got, I've got a hard time following that, I think. So uh, if they're all the same, and they all, of course, they're distributed ones, so for the further ones, you only see the very wide bursts, so they, repeat, they appear to repeat less often. Let's say they are the same objects for now. And of course, from the repeat rate, um, what you find is, okay, so at a fixed detection rate, the closer you are, the more often you go off. But if it diverges, I would have thought at some flux-limited survey like Chime, it, in infinity is a, is a big number, and since we see a finite number, I, I would have thought you need to put a cutoff on your power law, otherwise um, you get an infinite number on one of the two ends. Don't you? I mean, I guess maybe I'm missing something. Power laws diverge in my books, uh, in the Euclidean universe. Maybe it's not Euclidean that matters here. Yes, actually, I think the divergent part is because you're still limited by whether or not you have an FRB in your volume of your universe, right? So if you have a very shallow power law, your the expected number of bursts um, does get dominated by very strong repeaters. However, there's a good chance, I mean, these very strong repeaters must be very rare, right? If there's a lot of very strong ones. So I, I, I was still working that they're all the same, and whether they are strong or not is just because they happen to be nearby. But maybe this is too technical for a, a discussion, for a okay. offline discussion. Okay, we, I would like to keep talking about that offline because it is an important point. Yes. Uh, so, so, so yes, let's try to follow on Yes, thank you very much. This is a timekeeping. I'm very sorry. So we have to move on the next uh, speaker, and then we have lots of questions to the currency store. So therefore. Uh, let's discuss uh, and also let's ask additional questions in the discussion time uh, after the, this uh, session. So hopefully, Clancy can stay uh, until the discussion time ends.
So, okay, let's move on. Thank you very much.